Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. The last couple of weeks we've been studying concerning the circumstances surrounding the birth of John the Baptist and then of our Lord. The last account that we have concerning Jesus before his water baptism at the age of uh, 30 is this account at the age of 12 in Jerusalem. And so now it moves many, many years, probably, you know, 18 years or so forward as we come to chapter 3. John the Baptist is now fully grown, and so is Jesus. And in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and the region of uh, Tonsilitis, and Lysicius there of Abilene, Texas. He was there. And See how I can make the scriptures just relate to us so easily. Such a gift. Well, what is, what is Luke doing? He's doing, he's a meticulous man, he's a physician. We like meticulous physicians. So he continues his pattern. Uh, that he'll continue throughout the book of establishing the dating for the events based upon who was in political power and then who was in spiritual power, which he moves on to in verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And John was kind of raised out in the wilderness, the wilderness of Judea, probably up in the region of Jericho, and if you ever get to see pictures of that region or go to Israel, it is a wilderness. It is a desert area, and uh, it'll raise you one tough little prophet, and so, <laughs> and so it did. And John the baptizer went into all the regions surrounding the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Jesus did not institute the concept of water baptism. That was something that had been a part of uh, the Jews and their spiritual life for a long time. And uh, they had what was known as a mikvah. And uh, the temples, before they were destroyed, and Herod's temple there in Jerusalem to this day, they have all of these baths in the region of the temple that would fill up with water from the times in which there would be the, uh, the rain and all, and then they would empty and fill them as necessary in the dry season. But when people would come to meet with the Lord at the temple and bring their sacrifice, they would go into the mikvah, and they'd take off their clothes, and they would dip themselves down into the water. And it was symbolizing something outwardly that they wanted to, uh, that was supposed to be a representation of their heart, that they were desiring to come to God clean and holy and pure. But as is, you know, the problem concerning any ritual like that, pretty soon it just becomes ritual. And so the Jews began to think that they were pure and clean and holy in the eyes of the Lord on the basis of, of the form rather than the substance of their heart. And so they began to disassociate the ritual at all with the condition of their heart. And so as long as they went down in the mikvah and went up there, it didn't matter how wicked their heart was. They they were okay before God. John the Baptist comes on the scene and says, no, that's not acceptable. You can mikvah yourself to death, but it's unacceptable to God. And John the Baptist offered to baptize them, and he said, I'll baptize you unto the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In other words, if you really want to repent, you really want to turn from your way to turn God's way, if that's the condition of your heart, and you really uh, want to have a water experience, I'll give you one. But I'm not going to do it if it's disassociated with reality. As it is written, verse 4, in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. 
and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so here is the prophecy of Isaiah concerning a forerunner that was to come before the Messiah. And in the ancient days when a king would come to visit a distant province, they would smooth out the roads and they would make the roads straight and all in a physical sense. And Isaiah prophesied concerning one who would come before the Messiah who would do that in a spiritual sense, to make people's hearts smooth and soft toward God, to make their hearts straight toward God rather than crooked. And so here is John the Baptist come to do spiritually uh, what was a very common image in their mind in a physical sense concerning the kings. And it's beautiful here as Luke writes in verse 6, And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Luke is a Gentile. And every chance he gets to emphasize the fact that Jesus came not only to save Jews, but to save Gentiles, he does it. And so the emphasis is upon the all, that John the Baptist came as a forerunner for a Messiah who came to save the whole world. And the Jews had largely lost sight of the fact that God was interested in the Gentiles. He wanted to work through the Jews, and the Jews, of course, are the blessing Uh, in, In the seed of Abraham, a blessing to all nations supremely in that they provided this world with a Savior through that lineage. But over time, they began to see themselves better than the Gentiles and and all of this kind of thing. And they forgot that God was interested in the Gentiles, too. And Luke is careful to bring this out so that they could see it once again in their Old Testament scriptures. And then John the Baptist said to the multitudes that came out to him to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, and a viper was a dangerous snake, you little brood of snakes who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Apparently John the Baptist hadn't been reading about the new seeker-sensitive services that are all the rage today. Multitudes came to hear John the Baptist because he told them the truth and because it was real in his life. And if God has called you to declare his word, declare his word, and the personality that he's given you, let him sanctify that personality But we're about to lose several generations right now on planet Earth because we are so absorbed with the form rather than the substance. And this world is dying for the substance. And it ticks me off. It makes me mad. Someone was straight enough to live this life that God has called us to. And when the time came that he knew that this stupid idiot named Damien Kyle was willing to listen to the truth, he had someone in place that told me the truth, and his supreme concern was not with my feelings. I don't know about anybody else, but give me the truth. Don't hide the truth from me when my life is a daily nightmare and I want to know that there's a way of salvation. They're not going to shock me to call me one that's a part of a brood of vipers. I know what I was. I know what I am. It just tells me that what comes next is the truth. And we're wasting too much time on a song and dance. Yes, we ought to be sensitive to people, sensitive to context. We ought to be like Christ. But we're thinking too much these days. We're called to preach this gospel. And to teach this word to a world that is slowly, whether they do it in an instant in time, and you pick the newspaper up and it's happening every week, someone's taking their life, or whether they do it over the course of three score and ten years. It's the same end. 
And so here is John, and praise the Lord for someone strong who comes on the scene, and he just says what God told him to say, and then he leaves it there. There were multitudes, verse 7, and he told them when they came out to be baptized, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. I'll tell you, they knew wrath was coming. People know wrath is coming. You know, I don't know how many generations ago it might have been in the United States where there are two cars in every garage and however many chickens in the pod and all these things where everything's going swimmingly and uh, people don't have a sense of their danger. I think people have a sense of their danger today. This world is moving very fast toward a very prophesied end. I mean, it is coming very, very quickly. And there's a division going on toward those that want to be blind and ignore these things and reject God and hate Him and have nothing to do with Him. And then there's another, this gray area in between. It's, it's, it, it, neither the devil nor God's letting too many people stand in there. People have a sense, they just have a sense by the Spirit of God who is still active in this world and drawing people to God that something is terribly wrong on planet Earth and where it is heading. And this great nation, and it is a great nation that we live in, in the sense that it is still the greatest influence for Christ in the world. Well, maybe South Korea passes us. But in terms of resources for the kingdom, in terms of the potential for making a difference, I mean, it's, it's really, really there. And I mean, things are moving very quickly. People have a sense of it. They know that wrath is coming. And I don't know how anybody can argue today. I, I, in fact, I don't even hear it anymore. But people say, how can a God of love judge? I don't even hear that from people anymore. There's a sense that this world deserves judgment, that people deserve judgment from the highest levels all the way through. The sin is so rampant. And the sinner in rebellion to God is so in your face. And not just in my face, but in the face of God. There's a sense that when the judgment comes, it'll be due. I don't hear many people arguing about that anymore. There's a sense that judgment is coming. So John the Baptist said, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Fruits worthy of repentance. And repentance is an honor. It is a privilege that God has given us to be able to repent from my old life and my sin and to repent to or toward a new life. The word repent means to have a change of mind, and the battle's always won or lost in the mind or the will. To have a change of mind that produces a change of action. One day in my life I was going in that direction, away from God and rebellion to God, and repentance was to turn from that direction and now go on God's path and go in His direction. So he says to them, bring forth, therefore bear fruits, Worthy of repentance. Evidence that repentance has occurred. He is speaking to religious people. He's speaking to the Jews. And we know from Matthew's gospel that the religious leaders are there too because he directs this even specifically to the religious leaders, calling them a brood of vipers. They had no small amount of knowledge concerning God. They had a ton of religious activity. They knew all kinds of things. They could speak like greased lightning, the things of God. But they had no repentance in their life. And John the Baptist comes on the scene and says, I don't care what you know, and I don't care what you can say. There must be repentance. And he levels with them. He says, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. Don't... You know, trust in this, um, you know, these uh, relationships that you've had in, in your heritage that was godly. Abraham had his relationship with God. He'll stand before God on the basis of that relationship. And John the Baptist is, in essence, saying to them, you better get the same relationship from, uh, uh, with, with God yourself. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now, if you've been to Israel, you know short stones are in no short supply out in the wilderness. They're all over the place. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. 
And therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Judgment had begun now, and it would continue through Jesus, and it was a judgment upon these religious systems of these religious leaders that was leading people away from God, away from the intent of the Old Testament, away from a personal relationship with God. The religious systems of the scribes and of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. John the Baptist comes on the scene and says, God, and you don't even know it. As this religious group is there in the midst, you don't even know it, but the axe has already begun to cut you guys down. And so the people, verse 10, and this is beautiful. God bless people that are sincere about the things of the Lord. The people asked John the Baptist, and they said, what shall we then do? I mean, here they are in these, (laughs) surrounded by religion, and they come to John the Baptist and they say, could you tell us what repentance looks like in our life? Nobody's told us. Nobody's told us this was important to God. It's just a beautiful, sweet spirit. We don't have the foggiest idea where to begin with this. Could you tell us what this looks like in our life? Beautiful heart. And John the Baptist answered and he said to them, He who has two tunics, that is outer cloaks, let him give. And that's a key word there to him who has none. And he who has no food, let him do likewise, that is, give to him. In other words, if you have two coats and you have more food than you need and someone doesn't have enough, then give them what they need. Give them one of your cloaks or give them some of your food. Now, in ancient times, there were, the poor were working poor. There were no unworking poor. Unworking poor were called dead people. There were no signs at the major intersections of downtown Modesto begging for money. God had made a way for those that really wanted to work for food, to work for food. They could go out into the fields, and as long as they didn't harvest the field, they could go out and eat. A certain amount of food was left on the trees and on the vines out in the field so that they could go out and they could glean of that. And God spoke continually to his people to take care of the poor. Not the lazy, but the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. No matter how hard some people work in all this, there's always going to be poor. They're always going to have need. And it's interesting here that when Jesus or John the Baptist speaks to these people, he doesn't say to them, take note of the poor and have kind of a warm feeling in your heart toward them and then think that that's repentance. He uses the word that is so hard for us, the word give. Give them something material as an expression of your grace and mercy toward them. In other words, he tells them now, live a life that is dominated by grace and and mercy in a practical, experiential way. And so it's beautiful John the Baptist isn't going to let us live in our heads. So I had a warm feeling about the poor today. Yes, I'm just like Christ. I say be giving before we're there. And then the tax collectors, and they hated the tax collectors. These guys were professional thieves in essence. But the tax collectors listened to John the Baptist here, and they also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, What shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed to you. In other words, be honest, which was about the hardest thing that he could ask of them. People will know that you are a repentant tax collector when you're honest. (laughs) So I heard someone teaching related to this, and they said that they'd uncovered in the ancient world at the time of Rome a statue that had been raised up and dedicated to an honest tax collector in a certain town. They were so rare. When they ran into one, they were so happy that they built a statue to him. And so here was this thing where they just said, deal honestly. And likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? And so he said to them, 
do not intimidate anyone with your position. And, of course, in those days, it was not only would it apply to what we would call a soldier today, but it would apply to law enforcement. It's a position where you can really shake people down. All you have to do is go to Mexico, see how often you get shook down trying to get where you're going. And so it, in the ancient world, there was a kind of thing where the soldiers would kind of supplement their income. They had some power here. And, uh, and so he tells them that they're not to intimidate anyone or accuse falsely anyone and to be content with your wages. In other words, no extorting others. And now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so they look at John the Baptist as an extraordinary figure, and they say, all right, we don't even have to wait for the Messiah. This is the Messiah. And John the Baptist said, no, I'm not. In fact, I'm not worthy to have the lowest contact with the Messiah when he comes, to even loose his sandals, to take him off his feet, to wash his feet. And he said, when the Messiah comes, he won't baptize with water. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that's the way that it is in the world. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was a blessing that the Messiah would bring, and the baptism of fire was a baptism of judgment that the Messiah would bring. And Jesus Judges men's hearts. Uh, as, as J. Vernon McGee put it so well, there's only two kinds of people in this world. There's saints and ain'ts. And here we are, as I often say, we live in the most hyphenated country in the world. But God looks at all of mankind and they simply fall into two categories. Those that believe and are baptized into the body of Christ and those that reject and then store up for themselves a baptism with fire, a judgment that is yet to come. And he describes that judgment in verse 17. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will gather, he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so in those days, when they would bring the harvest in, and they would take the grain and they would lay it out on the ground, uh, preferably up on a hilltop where a wind would be blow, blowing, and then they would kind of uh, have various means of kind of crushing the wheat in order to get the hull off of the meat of the grain. And then having done that, they would take the baskets and they would throw these things, the, the grain up in the air, and as the wind would blow, it would take the chaff off in its, to its direction and its end, which would be the fire, and then the wheat would... Uh, stay in its place and, and be gathered into its appointed place. And when they didn't fi couldn't find a, a hill where there was a wind blowing, then they would take this winnowing fan and someone would use the fan in order to do that. And so that's the imagery that they uh, knew from their childhood and has to be explained to us today. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. So this wasn't all that John had to say. He had many other things to say. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by John the Baptist concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. And so Herod uh, took a liking to his brother Philip's wife, and uh, she left Philip and then married Herod, and John the Baptist came to Herod and declared that this was unlawful, it was unacceptable in the eyes of God, and then Herod had him arrested, and then, as is told in, in other Gospels, um, he ultimately was uh, beheaded as uh, Herodias worked her way to accomplish that end. It's interesting to me, with John the Baptist's arrest here, to see that he was a man that was uncompromising, and he was a man who was fearless for the truth, not only when he was in the wilderness, but when he was in a king's castle. You know, sometimes it is easiest to be bold in front of a big crowd, and then you get one-on-one -on -one with a power broker, and you cave. And John the Baptist sold out completely to the Lord, 
And he was who he was and what he was in whatever environment God put him in. What an outstanding brother in the Lord. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And Luke, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus, he also emphasizes Jesus' prayer life. And so he mentions what the others don't mention, and that is while John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus, that Jesus was praying. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon Jesus. So Jesus begins his public ministry with the upon experience of the Holy Spirit. That is the baptism with the Holy Spirit that Jesus spoke about as being available to us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And the voice came from heaven, the Father speaking, and said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And the Father in heaven is pleased with Jesus and Jesus alone. Not Jesus and something else, or me without Jesus or anything. So I need to be in Christ Jesus, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, in order to be accepted uh, into heaven. In this baptism of Jesus, you have a beautiful picture of the triunity of God. You have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit all present at the same time. The uh, UPC church, uh, everywhere that they are, they uh, believe in a Jesus-only doctrine and that the, uh, the Godhead or that the God only manifests himself in one person and, and he is manifesting himself in the person of Jesus at this time. And so they don't believe in the triunity of God and they have no explanation for the triunity that is apparent and spoken of at the baptism uh, of Jesus. Now, Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. And 30 years of age was significant among the Jews. It, it opened the door to certain kinds of ministry associated with holy things. A man was considered a man at 30, uh, more or less in those days. He was younger, but I mean in terms of handling spiritual things, 30 was kind of a minimum age. And so Jesus, he begins his public ministry at about 30 years of age. And then it moves on to a genealogy uh, of Jesus. And we read one of the genealogies of Jesus uh, in Matthew's Gospel. That was the genealogy of uh, Joseph, who was his stepfather. This is a different genealogy. This is the genealogy of Mary. And so, as it says now, Jesus himself be began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. He wasn't really the son of Joseph. But here you have Mary's genealogy that begins with a mention of Joseph because she's married to Joseph, and so she's under kind of his headship. But the, but the genealogy is, is Mary's genealogy. And it's interesting because God declared that when the Messiah came, he would be a descendant of David, and that there would be a king of a descendant of David, who, of whose kingdom there would be no end. And it's interesting that when God speaks of the Messiah who was to come through the lineage of David, uh, as the kings came down through history, through uh, you know David's line, through Solomon, there came a point where a king by the name of Jeconiah came into rule. And Jeremiah prophesied by the Spirit of God that no descendant of Jeconiah would prosper as a king in Israel. In other words, he cut off the whole line of, of kings coming down through Solomon's lineage from David. And, and so one of the interesting things about Jesus and, and all is that Jesus... Uh, could not have been a physical descendant of Joseph and have been accepted as the Messiah because he would have been a descendant of Jeconiah. And yet, he had to be a descendant of that kingly kind of reign in order to be accepted and gain the legal lineage in order to be accepted as Messiah of by the children of Israel. But if he came only from that lineage, he couldn't be the Messiah. So God is, I mean, he's made an impossible situation for himself. And the only solution to the prophecies that he gave 
toward David and Jeconiah is the solution that he came to here, and that is that Jesus would come as the adopted son of Joseph, and an adopted son in the Roman Empire received the full rights as a son, and so he gains the legal right to be called the king and a descendant of the, of the kingly uh, descendant of kings, and yet here he is, born to a virgin and uh, a part of this, uh, this other lineage uh, that allowed him uh, to continue that uh, reign of, or that line of David in, in order that uh, he might also not fall under the curse of Jeconiah. Well, uh, I, uh, it's confusing, uh, but it's, it's very interesting in, in the study of it because the only solution was exactly what God did, a virgin birth with a stepson who had the other lineage. You notice in verse 38 that Luke, and this makes it this genealogy different from the one in Matthew, that Luke takes this genealogy all the way back to Adam. Uh, in Matthew's genealogy, because that gospel is directed toward the Jews, it only goes back to Abraham. But remember that Luke is a Gentile. And so he doesn't just take it back to Abraham. He takes it all the way back to Adam, from whom all people, both Jews and Gentiles, have uh, descended. And so uh, Luke, you know, keeping uh, that whole love of the Lord for the Gentiles at the forefront. Chapter 4. And then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. And please notice that. Jesus is going to head into a temptation right now, a temptation that's going to be made against him by the devil, and uh, he's going to stand in this temptation because he's going to stand on the word of God. But we'll make a great mistake if we look and we say that the that Jesus stood within that temptation only on the basis of the handling of the word of God. To be fair and to be complete, he went into this temptation filled with the Holy Spirit. And we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we can always be filled with the Holy Spirit just for the asking. Lord, freshly fill me with your Holy Spirit. And he'll do that. So Jesus goes into this temptation, first of all, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Led by the Spirit into a wilderness to be tried. (laughs) Oh, doesn't sound like the Spirit-led book fly. I've been reading, you know. Sometimes the Spirit does that. And he goes into the wilderness, that wilderness of of Judea, and he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. Sometimes we talk about being tempted by the devil, don't we? So, oh, the devil, you know, he just tanned my heart today. (laughs) Probably wasn't the devil. (laughs) As important as I may think I am, I think the devil himself, and he is a finite being. He can only be one place at a time. He probably isn't that concerned with me. But he has plenty of demons that are. So he sends demons. Here is Jesus who goes head to head with the devil. In other words, what Jesus does, and what Jesus does in this temptation, is he handles it out of his humanity, not his deity. I mean, Jesus could have come on the scene and said, the devil comes on and says, listen, he starts to hassle Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, I don't have to take this flame on. Poof, there's this pile of ashes right there. And we read that and we go, yeah, all right, you know, in the the passage and all. And then you think, well, what hope is there for me? I don't have that kind of power to do that to the devil. And so what is Jesus going to do? He's going to handle it in his humanity. He's filled with the spirit. He's going to handle it with the word of God. In other words... That what Jesus models for us here as it relates to handling temptation will allow us to stand even under the temptation of the very devil himself, no matter how strong it might be. And do notice that to be tempted is not to sin. Jesus was tempted, but he never sinned. Oftentimes a person thinks, oh, what kind of a Christian am I to be tempted in these ways? Listen, join the crowd. You'll get your perfect body later. No temptation's overtaking you except it's common to man. I know what you're tempted with because I know what I'm tempted with. And so that idea sometimes is, oh, if I had hit this, you know, this higher life, I'd never be tempted. We're all tempted. We don't have to 
give in to the temptation. And in those days, that 40 days, Jesus had eaten nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, Jesus was hungry. And of course he would be after a 40-day fast. And it is at the end of those 40 days that the devil said to Jesus, and the devil chooses his times carefully, doesn't he? He waits till he's finished a 40-day fast under the direction of the Holy Spirit, and now he's going to come in and tempt him concerning bread. He's quite a student. The devil said to him, if, and the idea of if is since, since you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered, Him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So Satan directs his first temptation against Jesus and directs it against the appetites of the flesh. And the temptation is to obey your fleshly appetites over the word of God. They used to have a saying a while back where it says, if it feels good, do it. Whatever your body tells you. I mean, God has given us these desires, hasn't he? I mean, he's given us these feelings, and he's given us all of this. And, you know, and didn't God make all those drugs, you know, and everything? And, I mean, if he made all that stuff, shouldn't we just smash them into our face and our veins and go crazy? With, you know, I mean, he comes in and, 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 and starts to twist things. And so come in, and whatever the desire of your flesh is, whatever the appetite is of your flesh is, Obey that over the word of God. It's a very strong temptation. It's one that he makes all of the time. That appetite for sin is strong. And here the the appetite is strong for bread. There are other times where the appetite is strong for something else. So here's the temptation. And then Jesus answers. And he answers out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. And all three verses that he comes back against the devil with, all of them are out of Deuteronomy. There's a reason for that, because the devil's temptation against Jesus is uniform in that it is all three times a temptation to disobey God. And the single great theme of the book of Deuteronomy is obedience to God. And the children of Israel are leaving a period of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness They have lived in that wilderness. Jesus is in a wilderness. They've lived in a wilderness where they have had virtually no choice but to obey God. And God tells them, now you're going to go into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. In other words, you're about to head into a life where you have options. And I warn you that when these options come, and a lot of them are going to be appealing to the flesh... When they come, choose to continue to obey me. And that's the context of the passage in in Deuteronomy 8 that Jesus quotes here in in verse 4. And it's interesting that as things come up in our life, it's so important and so necessary to know the Bible well enough to, to know where to turn to. I mean, when a person is in a difficult trial in their life as a Christian, it's so important for them to know that the book of James and First and Second Peter are written for people that are just in the place that they're in, so they can turn there for the answers of what's going on in their life. And so Jesus goes to Deuteronomy and he quotes Deuteronomy, but he does more than quote Deuteronomy. He quotes it, But he obeys it. He obeys it. He is filled with the Spirit. He quotes the Word of God. But I mean, if you're going to quote the Word of God and not obey it, the devil just got his lunch. It's been catered for him. But there has to be not only the quoting of the Word of God, but I'm going to obey and stand on that Word of God. And that's what Jesus did here. And it's interesting that the devil comes to Jesus... And he tempts us in the area of our ability. He comes and he tempts Jesus to turn stones into bread. (laughs) Jesus had the ability to do that, and he's quite hungry. But God hadn't told him to turn the stones into bread. If the devil came to me out in the wilderness and said, Damien, I, 
I'm going to tempt you to turn stones into bread. No temptation. I have no ability to do it. And so he tempts in our area of we have ability. And every single one of us, and he tempts us to then use our ability for our own purposes and not the will of God and the word of God. And so God gives some of you the ability to communicate. He's blessed you with that. From the womb you've had that. And he intends that that would be given to him for his purposes. And yet a person can take that gift and use it to glorify and speak of and communicate concerning all kinds of nutty things in the world and completely waste it. To use it for my own pleasure. To draw notoriety unto myself. Someone else has a gift of mercy that's been given them to them by God. And it's a great gift in the hand of God, but someone who is a merciful person can begin to use that gift in such a way as to bring attention to themselves. And so the temptation of the devil is that we take our lives back under our own control, use these gifts, use these abilities for our own selfish means, rather than having them available for the purposes of God. And they're made available for the purposes of God through simple obedience. And then the devil in verse 5, taking Jesus up on a high mountain, showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. And what he's saying to Jesus is, You have come to redeem this world, haven't you? And the devil knew it. And the devil is saying, there's an easier way than God's way. You'll have the same end. It'll all be yours. And notice that the devil says it's mine to give. It is his to give. He's called the God of this age, the God of this world. Why? Because Adam and Eve forfeited it to to Satan in the garden. Jesus has redeemed the world. We don't yet see all things under him just yet. He's redeemed the world, but in Revelation chapter 5, he begins to break the seals of the scroll that constitutes the title deed of the earth, and he's going to take possession of this earth through the Great Tribulation. But in the meantime, it's the devils to give to as he sees fit. And here's the temptation. The temptation that the devil is using on Jesus is there's an easier way than God's way. You'll still get there, but there's an easier way. And the devil tempts a lot of people the same thing. It's really going rough for you, isn't it? Here you are. You're starving out in the desert here in the wilderness. I mean, God won't even let you turn some stones into bread and, and all of that. And you've come to do this. And I'll tell you, and, and he begins to cast out upon the goodness of God and and uh, the wisdom of God, and all of a sudden here, there's an easier way to do things. And therefore, if you'll worship before me, all will be yours. Yeah, there's an easier way, but by the way, uh, you know, sign, and then uh, no need to read the whole contract. It'll mean you worship me, but anyway, you know, they, you know, they do the commercials on the radio, and you know, right at the end there, the interest rate is, you know, 47%, you know, compounded daily. And, and that kind of is a move through real quick on it. And the devil and Jesus answered and said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Again, quoting from Deuteronomy. I think we have to be careful as Christians, especially concerning people we love and our family. To not always try and make everything all better for them and easy for them. There's a great tendency today, and I'm sure it's been through the ages, where there's a son or a daughter in a difficult, difficult trial and temptation. And it is the desire of a parent's heart so often to protect them from anything that's hard. And we can find ourselves tempting them in the same way that the devil tempted Jesus 
said, listen, this is too hard for you. Obeying God is too hard for you in this area. You're going to starve to death like this. You'll never get that promotion this way. Or you've got to, do, you've got to take things into your own hand. It'll mean a little disobedience. I mean, I mean, the word of God's fine, but I'm talking about reality, day-to-day life. This kind of stuff. They begin to undermine the authority of the word of God in a son or in a daughter. And it's the same temptation of the devil. To get them to take the easy route. But the easy route is the hard route. The way of disobedience is a difficult one. And Jesus, and then in verse 9, the devil brought Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall to, uh, revert to the Bible now. Jesus is responding to him with the Bible, and so the devil says, listen, we want to talk Bible. I know how to talk Bible. The problem is is that whenever the devil quotes the Bible, he always quotes it out of context, and he, and he misapplies it. It's amazing what you can come up with in the Bible if you disregard the context. And he begins to quote here now from Psalm 91, and the context of Psalm 91 is not to tempt God. The context of Psalm 91 is the blessing and the protection that God will give to the man or woman who puts their trust in God. It's not a a psalm that's given in order that a person might take and tempt God or force God's hand by putting themselves in danger. So he disregards, and of course he knows the Bible well enough to know that every fact is established under Jewish law by the mouth of two testimonies. And so, uh, and so he, he, named, he, he uses two verses here. Jesus knows what's going on. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so the third temptation that the devil brings against Jesus is to tempt God by going beyond what his word says. And he knows that if people disregard context and accuracy concerning the promises of God, that when their misunderstanding concerning the Scripture doesn't come to pass, that very often they'll be stumbled by it. This is one of the things, that, one of the big troubles with the health and wealth doctrine that was so big for so many years. It may be big now, but I'm out of the loop. I can't stand to know what's in anymore. But that God is always going to heal in every circumstance this way. God is always going to make you wealthy. They certainly did get wealthy. These kinds of things, and they take these promises out of the, the context of the entirety of the Bible. People build their lives on these things. Then it doesn't come to pass, and then their faith is absolutely shattered related to the Word of God. That guy was quoting the Bible. I mean, he was quoting the Bible, but... You know, he did. He ran me from verse to verse to verse to verse. I I could never check up on the context. That's the idea. And then I put myself and my life out there, not a life of faith, but a life of tempting God. And one of the devil's devices is to confuse the life of faith with tempting God. And then a person thinks that they're living the life of faith, but they're living a life of 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 testing God, and then when God doesn't come through on the basis of that misapplication of the Scripture, then their faith is shattered, and then a lot of people have to come along for a long time to pick up the pieces and then explain to that person that you never experienced God's Word yet, and this is what God has to say to you. So the temptation is still very effective, and Jesus responds to it candidly, And verse 12, again from the book of Deuteronomy, it says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, it's interesting that probably, in a sense, every temptation is found in those three temptations. You have the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The devil departed from him and never came around again for the rest of his ministry. that's That's the Grimm's fairy tale. Version. He departed from him until an opportune time. The devil is going to come back. Now it's interesting here that as the devil departs from him uh, until an opportune time, 
fascinating what you notice here and what I've noticed in terms of my own life is that oftentimes temptation, it doesn't come in this long, endless stream. So often it comes in a burst, doesn't it? Wow, for three days or for two weeks or a couple of months. I mean, it's just so heavy and intense, 40 days or whatever it might be. And then, boom, it's off. It's off. It's like, wow, you know. And then a little bit later, the burst comes on. And that's the way that the devil works. And then Jesus, verse 14, returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding regions. And he taught in all their synagogues, being glorified by all. And his ministry there as the Messiah in the northern region of the Galilee was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9. And, uh, uh, and so here is the fulfillment uh, of, of that.